Good morning. It's great to see everyone out this morning and everybody visiting. It's wonderful when we're all here in God's house and, and being God's children under the same roof. Uh, we do want to welcome everyone to our church, church services this morning. If you haven't see, seen David, David Eiton's here. It's great to see him this morning. Uh, go over and hug his neck when, after church or go hug his neck now. I don't care. But it's great to see him and him here this morning. Uh, I'm filling in for Leo, so I don't know for sure where Leo is at, but anyway, that's okay. Uh, look in our bulletin for prayer requests and announce other announcements. So a couple of housekeeping items in the few backs in front of you. There's uh, uh, a yellow card, I guess you could call it. That's for your attendance. If you fill those out and pass those in, with the, one of us will pick those up during the singing of the first song. The white cards are prayer requests. Uh, if you have a prayer request, they fill those out and pass those to the inner aisle. They'll be picked up during the invitation song. So this morning as we come to worship our Lord and Savior, let's clear our minds of worldly thoughts. Let's prepare to sing with joy in our hearts and just listen to God's word as Zach brings it to us. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. Father, we thank you for all your many blessings, Lord. We just ask that you would be with us this morning as we sing songs of praises to you and, and we uh, listen to your word that's brought to us by Zach. Father, we just ask that you would just open our hearts and our minds to what you have laid upon his heart to teach to us this morning. Father, we ask that you would bless our area with rain. Father, we ask that you would keep your hand of protection over our, our area, our city, especially right now during the high winds and the high grass fires that could happen today. Father, just be with us this morning. Help us to praise you in the manner that's worthy of the sacrifice that you made for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I have an announcement this morning. Uh, Lori, she'll be going to Amarillo May 7th uh, for her pre-op for her knee surgery. And then she'll have knee surgery May 13th. So we'll keep everybody informed of when it gets close to that date of what's going to be happening. So we we'll pray for her. Okay, this morning we'll sing our first song is Father Alone. <clears throat> Tempted and tried, we're all made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us never molested though in the wrong father alone will know all about it father alone will understand why Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Faithful till death, said a loving master. A few more days to labor and wait. Toes of the road will then sing as nothing. As we sweep through the beautiful gate, Father alone will <coughs> Father alone will under 
first and wide. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he come from his home in the sky, then we shall meet him in the bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. Father alone will know about it. Father alone will understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Our next song is Heavenly Sunlight. <clears throat> Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight. Heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is the light, in Him is no darkness, ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, Heavenly sunlight, <clears throat> flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises. Jesus is mine in the bright sunlight. Ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises. Gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight. Heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. <clears throat> A song that we'll sing for communion and offering. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear Falling on my ear, 
the Son of God. This and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there <clears throat> none other has ever known he speaks in the sound of his voice is so sweet <clears throat> the birds hush their swinging and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ring <clears throat> and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tell none other has ever known i stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe with all to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known at this time we want to prepare our mind and our hearts for the commemoration of our Lord and Savior's death, burial, and resurrection. For our reading, we want to include Romans chapter 5 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In Romans chapter 5, the Bible states, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, for a righteous man, righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some of them would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death, through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses number 23, where the Spirit says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father and God of heaven, we pray that as we commemorate your son's death, burial, and resurrection, that we will partake of this bread that represents his body on the cross, and we'll take it in a manner well pleasing before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Paul continues to write, verse number 25, he says, in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as she drink it in remembrance of me. So as, so as often as she eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthily manner will be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let each man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthily manner, in an unworthily manner, eats and drink judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we approach your throne of grace and mercy. We ask of you, dear God, to bless this cup that represents the fruit of the vine for your son's shed blood on the cross of Calvary. Pray that each one of us that partake of it, take it in a pure heart and a pure mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue in our worship, another part that we must and we are gladly participating in is the offering given back to the Lord that which supports the work here and the work elsewhere. Paul writes again to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses number 5. The Bible says, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exalt the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each one give as he has prospered in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that you always have an all-sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work as it is written. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor his righteousness endures forever. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this wonderful opportunity you granted to all of us to participate in the work of the, your, uh, the kingdom in spreading the gospel and supporting a local work in other places. We pray to God that each one of us would give according to our uh, ability, would join our heart and, and, and praise upon our lips for you are the one who gives us all things. So we ask you, God, to bless this offering. Be with those, Heavenly Father, who are sick in our congregation and elsewhere. This prayer we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Our last song we'll sing before Brother Green brings us our message is Send the Light. And if it's convenient, please stand. <clears throat> There's a call come ringing all the restless way. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light, send the light, 
the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonia call today, send the light, send the light, and a golden offering at the cross we lay, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed God, shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Please be seated. Thank you, Brian, for those songs this morning. Another wonderful day that God has blessed us with to gather here today, and those that are unable are still have the opportunity to watch online, and we're thankful for that. So it's hard to believe that next week is already Easter uh, in, in March and not April, because we're used to it being in April. So that being said, this week is Palm Sunday, the week before, and uh, this is the most important time uh, every year in Christianity because without Jesus dying on the cross, he would not be able to be risen again in three days, which is what has given us the hope of salvation and the promise of paying our debt for our sins. So uh, we're going to say a prayer here in a minute to get started, but just to let everybody know, today is going to be a little different because there's a lot of scripture to get into, and so you know, sometimes I have scripture and then I give some thoughts, and, but there'll be brief thoughts so we can get through all of the important points. And then next week, obviously, we'll talk about his resurrection and that hope that is given us because of it. So let's get started with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you again for another day that was not promised to us that we can arise and wake and breathe new life again uh, this day. We're thankful for all that you've done for us. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to worship without fear of persecution. And we pray that as I deliver this message, I'm just that messenger delivering your word and your will and everything we do this morning is uplifting in your sight. <clears throat> We're thankful for all that you've done for us, most of all, send your sons, whose name we pray, amen. So, uh, since it is kind of a, a little more serious talking about Jesus' death, I wanted to begin with a couple just little funny uh, things to kind of get lighthearted be at first. So six-year-old Kirsten was talking with her grandmother about church's Easter sunrise service, and she said, Nana, I'm not going to that rise and shine thing. I have to get up too early. <laughs> and then the next one was five-year-old Brian had a pivotal verse to recite in Easter, in the Easter program. It was, he is not here, he is risen, from Luke 24 and 6. But he couldn't remember what to say so the director quietly was trying to remind him of his line. So he confidently grabbed the microphone. He said, he is not here. He's in prison. <laughs> so just a little uh, lighthearted to get started. But if you will turn with me to John chapter 12, it will begin in verse 12. <clears throat> John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. 
And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, for just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd had been called, that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. And the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So <clears throat> this is the time also of the Passover. And if you're not familiar, Jesus had been spending some time away from Jerusalem uh, in his own study and, and alone. But he knew that he had to come back to Jerusalem to fulfill the prophecy, to fulfill God's plan of being betrayed, being arrested, and then dying on the cross. So he's coming back, and this is where we get the reference to Palm Sunday. You see the, in the scripture they have the uh, palm, branches of palm trees, and the reason for that is it's a sign in that time of victory. And so, but the difference is the people, the disciples, everyone there, they were thinking that Jesus was coming as a political uh, overthrow of the Roman government. They didn't understand yet that it wasn't a political thing, but rather a spiritual thing. And we're, they're going to see that coming up in the next, uh, in the future here. But so the heroes of the ancient world, they would come in, they would ride on horses, you know, as if they're going to war. But instead, Jesus takes the donkey's colt, and it's just as it is written, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And that's kind of a animal that is for peace, Jesus coming for peace. But we know that he's not going to experience peace because they, they didn't accept him. They didn't want to believe what he was saying was true. It, would get, it was against everything, all their selfish pride and their power and their ego. So, Instead of coming to grant them independence from the Roman uh, uh, government and give Israel independence, Jesus was coming to fulfill the scripture, to fulfill God's plan for him. So, if you will, turn with me to Matthew 26. That's where I'll begin next. But I want to read 1 John 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We've been talking about this, right? Jesus came... His grace extends for us, not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. He didn't, Jesus doesn't pick and choose. God doesn't pick and choose. Everyone is sinners. Everyone is lost. Everyone is needing hope of saving. But Jesus and God came for everyone. His hope is that everyone will come. But instead, as we know, humankind, not everyone wants to accept. And that's where we're going to see throughout the lesson this morning. So Matthew 26, and beginning in verse 20, says, When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve, and as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after another, Is it I, Lord? And he answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. And the Son of Man goes as is written to him, But woe to the man to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. <clears throat> so, what do we know before? The, you know, this obviously at the time of the Last Supper. And Jesus is saying, One of you will betray me. And we all know it's Judas. Before this, Satan had already entered into Judas's heart and soul. If you want to read earlier in the scripture, you want to go to Mark 14, 10, that's one of the references. But Judas goes to the chief priest and he says, if I give this man up to you, what will you give me? You know, he was again looking out for myself. And he, he, they said, we will give you some money. I, think it, I believe it was like 20 shekels, which in today's amount is about 90 anywhere from 90 to $450. In the grand scheme of things, for the savior of the world, for savior of mankind, that is a slap in the face because that showed how little value 
the Roman government, the chief priest, all of them had on Jesus' life. And so Judas is, betr- is betraying Jesus. He had already been controlled by Satan. Yet despite all this, what did Jesus do? He washed the feet of Judas and all the other disciples, knowing what was going to happen because it was an example for us. But then notice this scary thought here. Verse 24, the Son of Man goes that is written to him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for him to not been born. You, you know, we have to be careful ourselves that we're not like Judas. Can we betray Jesus in this world today? Obviously, yes, we can. The world is doing that today whenever they're trying to say all of these things are okay that we know is, goes against Scripture. They want to, you know, take the Bible and chop it up. I want to follow this, but I don't want to follow this. And what did we see last week? Last week, we looked at the scripture. It says, if you break one of these commands, it's as if you broke the whole law. So we have to be very careful that we do not betray Jesus either. So 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Christ gave the ultimate example. He died for all of us. We we looked at last week. He gave us all grace. So we need to show grace and love towards others. And it goes to this extent. Think about this right now. Everyone in here, would you be willing to give your life for everyone else in this room? That is the ultimate command. We are to love each other so much, have a unity of spirit and mind so much, that we extend the same love, the same grace that Jesus and God gave us, that we would be willing to die for one another. If somebody came in here with a gun or whatever, we try to go and stop them because of our love for one another. And that's just one example. But Christ gave the ultimate example. We are to strive to be like him every single day of our lives. So now continue. Mark chapter 14 beginning in verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But I, after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, Even though they will all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. So here Jesus is telling the disciples they will all fall away. What do you think that means? It means when he is betrayed, when he is pointed out by Judas to the chief priest, they're all going to scatter away because they don't want to suffer the same consequence. They don't want to be arrested like Jesus. They don't want to be beaten and flogged and suffer the same kind of sentence, right? But Peter says, no, even if everyone else falls away, I will not. And Jesus is foretelling what's going to happen. And he says, you are going to deny me three times. And Peter still does not believe him. But we're going to see here very shortly that it does in fact happen. Jesus does not lie. So next, Matthew 26 and verse 39, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus showing the same human emotion that we might be feeling, knowing, you know, he's in the garden of Gethsemane, he's praying to God. He wants, if any, any possible way to save mankind without him giving his life, can it be possible? Because he knows the pain and the suffering that he's going to go through. But the most important thing to look at is how he says here, nevertheless, not as I, but as you will. We sometimes as humans 
You know, we, we want to have this plan for our lives. We want everything to go our way, and whenever God doesn't align it that way, we get mad, we get frustrated. But sometimes, as we know, God's plan is better, and we need to pray like Jesus, not as I will, but as you will. Whatever your will be done, Lord, in my life. Now continuing, we're going to look at Luke 22, beginning in verse 54. <clears throat> it says, Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I did not, do not know him. So that's the first time Peter denies Jesus. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. So again, second time now, Peter has denied Jesus. And then after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. And Peter said to him, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, Today you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Just as we looked at a few moments ago, Jesus foretold this to Peter. Peter said, no, if everyone falls away, I am not going to. I'm not going to. And he says, yes, you will, before the rooster crows twice. And then, in fact, it does happen, and he looks directly at Jesus and can only imagine the look that Jesus had on his face. Probably upset. He doesn't want to be you know, Jesus doesn't want to be, I told you so, but more of an upset, upset that you would betray me. You see, Jesus knew this was part of the plan, but instill in every aspect, Judas betraying him, Peter betraying him, the trial, the arrest, cru crucifixion, the flogging, the beating that he's suffering, he still had the human emotion. He still wanted it to be gone. He still knew it was part of the plan and he had to go through with it. And we, he could have stopped it at any time. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. But as we see in verse 62, Peter went out and wept bitterly. I'm sure as we all would be, he was overcome with emotion. He couldn't believe that even though he thought he was strong enough that he fell away, that he denied Jesus. He didn't stay strong in the faith, and he was overcome by Satan and the world and his selfish pride because he didn't want to be arrested. He didn't want to be beaten. He didn't want to be tried that he denied Jesus three times. It was all part of the plan, and even though as sad as it may be, Judas was part of the plan. Peter was part of the plan. All of it was coming together. So, Isaiah 53 Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was cursed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Obviously his wounds being the physical scars where the nails were in his hand and in his feet, and all the beating marks that he suffered. The, what we partake every Sunday, the communion, the bread that represents his body upon that cross for us the cup that represents the blood that he shed for our sins. Because remember, in the Old Testament, every time you sinned, you had to offer an animal sacrifice. But it wasn't just, you couldn't go get the one that was three-legged, that was about to die anyways. It had to be the perfect, the best, without blemish, the lamb. And that was what Christ was, our lamb. But the sacrifice was once for all, that, so no more blood had to be shed. So Mark 15 is where we're going to be next. But I want to talk about, because I didn't put all of this in there, uh, just for the sake of time, but Judas, 
he picks out Jesus in this crowd. It's at night. And the reason he had to identify, he identified him with a kiss to the chief priest so they could arrest him. Because in that day and time, you know, now you can't go anywhere without your face on camera somewhere. And everyone has, you know, face ID to unlock their phones and all of those things. You didn't have any of that. So they wouldn't have known it had to be someone that was close to Jesus to know what he looked like, who he was. And that's why Judas was selected. And then, you know, he gets arrested and and then they have the trial. Well, Herod and Pilate both didn't think Jesus was guilty. But as we're going to find out here in a second, It didn't matter because their pride, their ego to stay in power overcame what they thought about Jesus being innocent, that he had no guilt and they could have stopped it, but they didn't want to suffer any consequences either. They didn't want to lose their reign of power. They didn't want to suffer like Jesus did. So uh, Mark 15 and verse 6, and now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So the trial has been made, even though they both didn't find Jesus guilty. The crowd, the chief priest, wanted him to be crucified. And this was a a common occurrence. They wanted to, they released at this feast, the Passover feast, they release a prisoner. So Pilate's thinking one last ditch effort. Well, surely this man that was basically like a terrorist, causing all kinds of insurrection in the city, murdering people, you know, and then you have Jesus on the other hand that did no wrong, but they falsely accused him of blasphemy and all kinds of things, he's thinking, well, surely they're going to release the one that's innocent. But no. You know, he says, are you sure? He asked him multiple times, are you sure? What has he done wrong? But instead of answering him, they just yell, crucify him, crucify him, yell him even louder. They're fixing to have a riot on their hands. So Pilate, because he wants to stay in power, he doesn't want to be you know, part of the riot. He doesn't want an insurrection to happen to him. He, he released Barabbas, a murderer. You think about that again, a murderer who caused all kinds of problems and insurrections in the city for innocent Jesus to be hanged on the cross because he was a people pleaser. He wanted to make the people happy. Think about a uh, similar instance in today's society. You think about somebody that becomes falsely accused of something and the judge or the jury decides to sentence them to life in prison or to death. But they did nothing wrong. All because they wanted that power and that ego. But now we're going to see Jesus now take his steps towards his last breath on earth before he's risen again. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Another reminder that it's for all. And as we've looked at the last few weeks, his promise is for all. No matter how far you stray away, no matter how long you've been away, he is there like the prodigal son in Luke 15, waiting for you to come back so he can run to you. You just have to draw near to him. But Matthew 27, verse 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry the cross. 
And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them, casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And so also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, he, can, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. If he trusts God, let God deliver him now, for he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were with him crucified, were crucified with him, also reviled him in the same way. So, as we, we go back to the beginning here, pick it up on the verse where they found a man, Simon, to carry his cross. So a tradition before this that I didn't put in the scripture, Jesus was carrying his own cross. Now remember, before, during the trial, because Pilate thought if he just had him beaten and flogged and scourged, that they would be satisfied and they wouldn't want him to be crucified. So they beat him within an inch of his life. So he probably can't even barely walk But a tradition is for the prisoner or the criminal to carry the cross at least a mile out of the city on their on their backs. But he literally got to the point where he could not even move and they had to find someone else to carry it. Now, the reason is the cross estimated weight is one hundred and sixty five pounds. And. It's also the size of a modern-day railroad tie, probably about six foot long, two beams. Think about, you know, a 50-pound bag of concrete, carrying three of those on your back. A healthy, strong person would have trouble doing that for a mile, much less somebody that's already been beaten to the point of almost dying. But Jesus did it until he was no longer. So then they come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Now this place was outside the city of uh, Jerusalem, and it was upon a hill. And the reason for that is so their hopes were that people would see from the city the people hanging on the cross as a point or a stark reminder of not to commit crimes. Because you can see the punishment visible as a warning to them. So... Then he was taking wine to drink, but he did not drink it. So as was accustomed there, was they would give people kind of like a last-ditch thing of mercy or, to, or they would give them this wine to kind of help ease their mind to, to, so that they could inflict even more pain upon them. Kind of like if you were given medicine of, you know, like, uh, what's it called? Uh, can't think of the name right now, but the medicine they give you whenever you have surgery to, to, in the hospital. What? Yeah, anesthesia, yeah. I get it here in a minute. But the point was so that they could inflict even more pain upon people. They would go about and they would break their legs so that, you know, because they would have to try to push up so they could have more air. So they break their legs so that they cannot push up even anymore, and then they suffer slow death where they can't breathe anymore so but he denies it because he wants to experience the full suffering for our sake then they go on divided his garments among them casting lots he is hanging on the cross and they are gambling his clothes among each other selling the clothes and and all of that and you know it's just sickening that they would not only put a man up on the cross that had done no wrong, they, they just act like it's no big deal, they're going about their day. Then, uh, Pilate had the, the saying written, this is the king, Jesus, king of the Jews. The reason for this was the criminals, they would put on above their cross what their, you know, like murder, adultery, whatever their uh, crime was. Pilate did this kind of as a way to get at the chief priest. Because again, he didn't find Jesus uh, uh, doing anything wrong. 
And he knew that this would infuriate the chief priests because they didn't believe that he was the king of the Jews. But as they're fixing to find out, he was in fact king of the Jews. So then they go on and they're mocking him. You know, you say you're going to destroy the temple, rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Well, they're thinking of a physical building temple, like a church. They're not going to realize until a little bit later that he is talking about the temple being himself. He is the church. He is the head of the church. Then they go on and say he saved others. You know, they saw him perform miracles, yet they still didn't believe in him. He literally saved people or brought them back from life. And they're like, well, then why can't he save himself? And then they, they're, they're doing what you can't do. And you're trying to tempt God by saying, well, I believe if you save him. Let God deliver him now, then I will believe. That's not how it works. God is not a toy to play with. You have to believe 100% without a doubt in your heart and in your soul. You can't go around saying that, you know, it's like, like we do today. Oh, please pray for the Cowboys to win a Super Bowl and then I go to church. It don't work that way. So, what they're going to soon find out is that the temple was not the building but the physical body. And then the, the robbers who were crucified him also reviled him in the same way. And again, another scripture that it did not put up on there was one of the robbers is, you know, mocking Jesus and the other one says, you know, why are you doing that? We deserved this death that we are dying. This man did no wrong. And what did Jesus tell him? This day, truly I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Because he, this criminal, he recognized before his very death of the power of Jesus. Now again, Romans 6, 23 tells us what? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift. We all deserved death for our sin. But Jesus came, paid the debt that he did not owe for us. And at any moment in time, he could have called 10,000 angels. So now we're going to see in Matthew 27, beginning in verse 45. It says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemme sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were also open, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with, with him, keeping watch over him, Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. <clears throat> so, going back again to the beginning. Sixth hour to the ninth hour. There was darkness all over the land. The middle of the day. You know, like we're fixing to have the solar uh, eclipse, right? And you're going to have darkness for a few moments because the moon is covering the sun. Well, that only happens once every so many years. There is no other explanation for darkness to come upon the land for three hours in the middle of the day than a higher power in God doing that, showing to try to show the people, this is the son of man, this is my son who I came and he came to save you and to save the world. And so, then Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And it's believed, you know, obviously as it would be with any human being, intense emotion, possibly, you know, it is beyond our comprehension because Jesus is experiencing a strain here from human mankind with God the Father. And we're not able to understand what this means. And then the people think he's calling Elijah. So now they give him this wine. But this time, you know, the first time Jesus denies it. This time he accepts it. And the reason is there's no possibility that he's going to uh, become intoxicated or have any effects of the wine because he's literally about to take his last breath. So, and he also takes it to fulfill the prophecy from Psalm 69 and verse 21. But then in verse 50, what does it say? Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He yielded up his spirit, meaning he willingly gave up his life. It was not what they did, beating him, nailing him to the cross, all of that. He could have stopped it at any time, but because of God's plan, he willingly gave up his life. And then there was an earthquake, and the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom in two. Again, there is no other explanation than a higher power in God, because if we looked about several months ago, how big this, this curtain was. And it took 200 men to raise the curtain temple, the uh, temple curtain. And the reason behind, because back then, whenever you had the animal sacrifice, and only once a year could the, the uh, high priest go into that for, the, for mankind, for their sins. And you couldn't even touch the Ark of the Covenant without being struck dead. As we saw, they're taking it down the road, and it becomes weak, and so they think they're trying to help. But then they're struck down immediately because they didn't follow God's command. But the point is, now that Jesus has yielded up his spirit, there is no longer that separation between man and God. As we've done several times this morning already, we have prayed to God, relationship with him. And that's because of this. Because now we have the opportunity to come to him at any moment in time because he came and yielded up his spirit. But then there's an earthquake and all of these people are coming about. And so the people that were talk, taking watch over him, they realize, oh no, this was the son of God. It, you know, they, it, Jesus did many things that should have brought them to, to recognize them and wake them up, saving people's life, you know, turning the, the, the meal into 5,000 and the list goes on and on. Yet it took darkness over the land, an earthquake, Jesus dying on the cross for them to finally wake up and realize, oh no, what have we done? And then they're about to find out, as we're going to look at next week, when he comes in three days, just as he promised, that he was in fact the Son of God. Because you're going to see, as we get in, I don't want to do too much this week, but they took special precautions to secure the tomb so that nobody could fake it like Jesus came back but they're gonna see that that couldn't stop them. No man tomb could stop Jesus. But there's no other explanation for all of this to happen other than God and his high power. First Peter three and verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but it may live in the spirit. Him dying on the cross, righteous for the unrighteous, which is us, because we all deserve death. You see, sometimes it's good to take a step back and just read and look at the scriptures of all the events surrounding and taking place up to Jesus' death on the cross. And then as we're going to look at next week with his resurrection, and remember how uh, lucky we are that he did that for us for you, for you, for you, and for me. Because without it, the Old Testament only told you how broken you were, not any giving you any way to fix it. Now we have the opportunity to fix it. But as humans, our selfish pride continues to get in the way, 
and our ego, as we saw with all of these people, Judas, Peter, Pilate, Herod, and continuing. But it's a good reminder of the promise of salvation that he's given us. And this is how you can gain salvation to hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Believe that Christ came for our sins as we just looked at. John 3, 16, repent of our sins, Acts 17, 30. Knowing that we have no hope without him, confess his name, Romans 10, 10. Be baptized under water for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, 38. And then most importantly, Revelation 2 and verse 10, live faithfully till the day we die and we receive the crown of life. It's not a put on Christ in baptism and then you go about your merry way. It's a daily battle with Satan that we have to overcome. But we have the hope of eternity one day because of Christ. And we're going to see that hope in the fact that he arose after three days. He's no longer here because he has risen. So if there's anything we can do this morning, if you want to put on Christ in baptism, if you just need the prayers, you need encouragement, whatever you may need, will you come while we stand and sing? <clears throat> Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bids me come to thee, O Lamb. I come, I come, just as I am and waiting not to rip my soul of one dark blob to thee whose blood can Cleanse his power, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, thy love unknown has broken Rebearer down now to be thine, yea, thine alone, O Lamb of God. I come, I come. Please be seated. Our last song we'll sing is It Is Well With My Soul. <clears throat> when peace like a river attended my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, what Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well With my soul It is well Who in my soul It is well, it is well with my soul, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole is to the cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my 
soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul and Lord hates the day when the faith shall be sighed the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well my soul it is well in my soul it is well it is well with my soul again we want to say that if you are visiting here with us you are indeed our honored guests and we would like for you to introduce yourself after worship so that we can shake your hand and give you a, a welcoming hug and let you know we are thankful for your presence in our assembly. Uh, there are just one card that we received, but we know that uh, Sister Gloria, we received information that Sister Gloria Swires had a fall and she's doing better, but yet we need to see how she is recuperating from that. So let's give her a call and go by and see how she was doing. Uh, Sister uh, Marjorie Woodridge, she is from what I gather, her health is a little bit um, unstable. She was recuperating, recuperating fine before, but need to check on her also and keep her in our prayers. We have a card here from Sister Joyce Brown. She says, I want to ask for prayers for my physical health and spiritual well-being, and also that she receives a good report from her uh, heart doctor on Tuesday. So we want to keep them in our prayers. Uh, I will let you know that uh, I'm asking for prayers. I'm not as young as I used to be, but God has been good to me and allowed me to get to the point to where I can look toward retirement. So I ask for prayers that as we go to the Social Security office Tuesday, tomorrow, that I can get all my, <laughs> some of that paperwork taken care of and that will facilitate the time date on which I can transition from secular to God's spiritual work. So keep me in your prayers. Uh, let us bow and go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father and God of heaven, we come before your throne of grace and mercy this morning, just thanking you so much for your kindness, your long suffering and forbearance toward all of us. And as we've assembled this morning to worship you in spirit and to in songs and hymns and then to listen to your holy word, we pray that, dear God, all that we've done this day has been found pre pleasing and acceptable in your eyes. Those, Heavenly Father, that we've mentioned in, your, in, in our assembly, uh, Joyce Brown, for a, a favorable report from her heart doctor, we know that you are caring for her through him, and we know that you have much more work for her to do, so therefore you will stabilize her health condition that she may continue to serve you spiritually. For Sister Marjorie Woodward and Sister Gloria Swires, we ask that you, dear God, will be with them, and Heavenly Father, restore their health and maintain their health, and let us be a source of comfort and, and encouragement for them and do all that we can for our brothers, our sisters in Christ. Be with the churches of Christ throughout this land and country. Be with our nation as a whole. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you are the one who reigns over the nations, and our dependency is not upon ourselves but upon you. So as we are planning to and preparing to dismiss our uh, assembly this morning, we pray that you will be with us, guide God and direct us through the course of the week, that we will glorify you in all that we do. This prayer we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>